I'm Joyita Gupta, and this is The Pulse. The personal is political. This is a defining slogan of second wave feminism. It expresses a common belief held by feminists that the personal experiences of women are determined by their political situation and their gendered reality. It's also a slogan that many people with disabilities have adopted, however unwittingly. Whether it's through a written memoir or via a YouTube channel, people with disabilities are relating their personal lived experiences and by sharing with a wider audience, simultaneously redefining the political terrain. It would be a mistake to assume that only lobbyists or political actors change the world. Often, it's ordinary people living ordinary lives who are genuine change makers. In having the courage to share the messy, beautiful, and sometimes vulnerable moments which define what it means to be disabled, they are changing the world, sometimes one YouTube video at a time. Today, we discuss autobiography as disability advocacy. It's time to put your finger on the pulse. Hello and welcome to The Pulse on AMI-audio. I'm Joyita Gupta. I'm joining you today from a boardroom in the accessible media offices in downtown Toronto. I am wearing a canary yellow v-neck sweater. It's fairly loose fitting and I am seated against a white backdrop. I have black hair which is pulled back and I am a brown woman and so my skin is slightly tan. My guest today is Sarah Patel. Sarah is the creator of The Thinking in Color, a YouTube channel and on that channel, Sarah discusses what it means to be low vision and Muslim. Sarah, welcome to The Pulse. It's really nice to have this opportunity to speak to you. Thank you so much, Javira, for having me on The Pulse. I will give a description, or to the best of my ability to give a description of what I'm wearing. I'm wearing a black uh, t-shirt. I'm also wearing a, black, um, a pink uh, hijab, a scarf that is tied in a turban uh, style, and I have a dark uh, background behind me. I'm also, um, I identify as Muslim, so I am a medium, I guess, tone. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, it's interesting. Um, I always find it a little challenging to do the, the descriptions, but I often think about how useful it is to provide that for people who are visually impaired. Is that something you, you thought about as well when you launched your YouTube channel, which is Thinking in Color? Uh, absolutely. I think um, I would say in the low vision community, because everyone, you know, my name is a very, I guess, westernized <laughs> name. So when at first um, impression or when I introduced myself, uh, nobody knows uh, what my background is till we get later into conversation. And then I identify as being um, a woman of color or a um you know, a, mus a Muslim woman um, until that point, or I've also gone like, you know, several occasions of meeting several people over and over and, and them not knowing till it's come out in conversation. And I have said it. So yes, to have the YouTube channel to give a bit of a platform um, where I can really show um, who I am and, and give the education as someone with vision loss um, and wearing a hijab. Um, hmm. Why is it called Thinking in Color? I was intrigued by the name and I wanted to ask you why Thinking in Color? Yes. Yeah, so it's, you know, it took me a long time to kind of come up with this name. But when I think of colors or, you know, with falls coming up, so everyone is so mesmerized by the fall colors, but someone that is low vision or blind, they can't re quite see the colors. Um, and colors not only represent what you see, but is what you feel, how, you know, what you think of, you know, it can be emotions, it can be so many things. So I have left it up to the viewers of how they interpret thinking in color, because thinking in color to me can mean so many different things, not just of what you visually are seeing out there and, and um, expressing yourself. 
the channel has such a wide range of content. Can you give us a bit of an idea of what all would we'd find if we were to click on your channel and start to watch? Yes, for sure. So it started off kind of very specific uh, to one area of uh, topic. Um, and from there, I said, you know, I just I just couldn't stick to that. I just there was just so much I wanted to share and so much I wanted to put out there. And I it, it's a lot. So it covers a lot. It covers, you know, me doing some travel, uh, living independently, uh, my journey with, you know, navigating healthcare system, some videos of, of my cat. So I've kind of included everything of myself um, that I would like to share with uh, viewers for them for them to see. I think a lot of times, um, especially coming from, you know, a Muslim background, a lot of times, uh, you know, women are sheltered or, are, you know, not really allowed to put themselves out there. And especially if you have a disability, you really are not welcomed in society or really not look up to as a as a whole person you're just kind of looked at oh she's a person with a disability so I really wanted to take this opportunity to show and give other individuals that are from ethnic backgrounds that you can live a full independent life there's so much more to it than just your disability mm, it's true and you know at least in my family and I'm from India and have a South Asian background and one of the things that I would often get told is um, if you don't use the vision that you have, then you're going to lose it. Yes. As though being blind is the absolute worst thing that could possibly happen to you. So no matter how much you have to squint, no matter how large the print needs to be, no matter how much you have to stare through a magnifier, mm -hmm. keep trying to see. Yeah. What kind of reception did you get from friends and family when you said that I am going to be putting my story out there on YouTube? I got uh, all-around support. I... Uh, for me, it was a bit different, I would say, just going back a bit, growing up as well. Um, my mom wanted me to have the most independent life as possible. And so when she was told that I would be losing all my vision in my late 20s or early teens, and the suggested uh, course was, you know, to learn Braille, I learned Braille um, because, you know, it was something that I, once I learned Braille, I, you know, it's something, it's a skill that you'll never uh, forget. Um, but at the same time, you know, and, and even using the white cane, you know, I had my own struggles with the white cane, but at the, but, you know, my mom always encouraged for me to use the white cane. Yeah, it's interesting because I had had such a different experience. I never learned to read Braille. I actually tried to learn to read Braille when I came to Canada and I was about 17 or 18. And I think you kind of missed the boat in terms of ever being very fluent with Braille. So to be honest with you, Sarah, the only yeah. Braille I can read is just enough to like read the elevator buttons. And there's a coffee yeah. machine at AMI, which has a lot of Braille on it. I just need to know how to make my latte. <laughs> so that's the extent of my Braille. Yeah. Uh, tell me a little bit about <laughs> how the YouTube channel that you're working on then relates back to some of the advocacy work that you're doing IRL in real life? So I've been, you know, on with CNIB for quite some time, sitting on their advocacy and ambassador board. I joined True Faces, which is another uh, organization and being on the ambassador board. Um, and just, I think, being in post-secondary, being in high school, one thing I've learned is just learn to advocate for myself and other people and really um, share what I know and the knowledge that I have. Um, with others and you know to be honest i always wanted to start a podcast or something just sharing my lived experiences bringing on other people that i know to talk about their experiences educating um the public just about you know certain things on myths about you know blindness and using the white cane just really trying to get as much as um, advocacy and education out there as possible and unfortunately i just never got around to it or you know I was a bit like I don't know should I do this should I not and I'll say um what really pushed me to do it was um when I got into 
a motor vehicle accident and I was like I you know what I really want to share how I'm navigating this the healthcare system in COVID times and and you know to to let people know what are the challenges and some of the struggles you face not only um with this pandemic that was going on that everyone was trying to figure out how to how to deal with but also the healthcare system and having a disability on top of that mm. I'm sorry to hear about the accident, Sarah. Are you doing okay now? I'm doing better, yes. Thank you. And so do you mind telling us what happened to you? Yes. So I was um, on my way to work um, of December of 2020, and uh, we were rolling up to a red light, and we were uh, rear-ended three times by two separate vehicles. Um, I was in an accessible mini van, the wheel trans. So it wasn't wasn't like a wheel trans bus. It was the... um, it was a van, so it was an accessible van, and um, unfortunately, I was kind of in my in that vehicle for about two hours till I got taken out. I walked away at that time with no um, provident injuries except for just um, you know not feeling quite well or you know um, feeling nauseous and stuff like that and. Uh, when I went to the ER, you know, was di- confirmed that, you know, I did have a concussion and, um, but no broken bones, but it just later on, you know, throughout the days, we realized that there was a lot of soft tissue injury, uh, whiplash. I ended up tearing my rotator cuff. So it, it definitely impacted um, my vision, which was quite uh, scary because until then, my vision was quite stable for what I have and to realize you know all of a sudden you cannot see quite well as you used to um along with you know you're feeling all these other aches and pains and uh it was it was quite challenging and it was quite um difficult to not know if you know the vision would that I lost if it's gonna go if it's gonna come back if it's just concussion related or if it's something that um you know, it just happened that I'm just all of a sudden drastically losing vision. Um, And it sneaks up on you too. And suddenly you don't know how you're going to manage the things that you used to always do. Exactly. I do rely a lot on my, um, on my side, like you said before, you know, I like to use what I, what I have. Um, Not, it's like, not in terms of like, not, not losing it, but also it's, it's a way to kind of, you know, keep your eyes stimulated and, and, and working right um so I definitely do yes rely a lot on my vision and whatever vision I have so it was quite hard to kind of digest and not know what the outcomes uh was going to be um but yeah what happened to you when you were when you were on the uh, when you were at the scene of the accident um what sort of a response did you get from the paramedics? Were they the ones to take you to the emergency room? Were they able um, to help you navigate? Because even without the complication yeah. of COVID, those places can be very challenging. Absolutely. For someone Unfortunately, who's no, I did not get a good re- response from the paramedics. I was quite shocked. Um, I've unfortunately had to have you know paramedics come attend to me in the past for other health reasons and things like that. So I I know you know they can be quite helpful and nice and you know when I told them like I don't feel well I feel nauseous I you know I'm I can't see well my vision is a bit blurry than what my normal vision is and and their response is well you can go about your day and if you if your symptoms get any worse you can go to the ER so I ended up going to work since I was a lot closer to work um and then called my parents and um you know had them come pick me up and take me then to the ER um and again at the ER they don't let anybody come in because um of covid so unless you know you are not ill or you don't have to be attended to you're not allowed in so again it was the advocacy piece of well you know what I and and they didn't really quite get well. She's partially said, so she can still see some, so she can still come in on her own. And it was to a point where mom was like, no, you know what? She's blind. She she can't see. She can barely walk on her, by herself. Like, she needs a support person. And sometimes you just have to pull pull the last yeah. card possible to, to get, you know, 
the help that yeah. you need. No, it sounds like it was a really bad experience. And it's one of the things that really prompted you to start to share your story on YouTube. Uh, but you've not just talked about your experience with the healthcare system. You've also delved into what it is to live with your disability. What are some of the other episodes and some of the other ideas and topics that you've touched on in, uh, in your YouTube channel? Sure. So uh, we did one episode of like myths, uh, you know, things that can eat that potentially could co- cure your eyesight. So coming from an Asian background, um, you know, I went to all the homeopathic doctors and other doctors and tried all these home remedies of potentially getting the eyesight back. So just, you know, like carrots are he- good for you, but you know, carrot is not carrot eating carrots. Yes, you need your food. It ain't going to do it. <laughs> it ain't going to do it, you know. Um, you know, talking about like having mushroom juice, like, you know, like put into our eyes. So we have like some episodes of that. Um, I also am a huge advocate of mental health, having um, a background in mental health. So coming again from a Muslim background, mental health is something that is not talked about. And I think in a lot of different um, cultures and backgrounds, it's, it's really not talked about. So I really wanted to, again, um, share my experience and, and you know, advocate for individuals that are out there that are struggling with any um, mental health to reach out. There are support systems. There are help out there. So, you know, doing little videos on, you know, loving yourselves or, you know, taking some time out to... Um, you know, self-care. Self-care is very important. Not a lot of times we forget to take time out for ourselves for self-care. So, you know, think about what you like to do and, and put that time aside, um, you know, slowly starting up once a week and gradually, you know, incorporating it into your schedules every day. Um, so, yeah, and then I did a I did a trip to Calgary. So kind of um, vlogging as much as I can about that. Again, you know, I went on my own with a bunch of friends. So documenting, you know, yes, as a person um, with a disability and from a Muslim background, you know, living independently, traveling independently, going out, um, exploring, seeing new people, meeting new people. Um, yeah. And so what sort of reception have you gotten from the general public to your YouTube? Do people recognize you and say, oh, my God, I saw you on YouTube? Uh, no. So <laughs> I don't think I'm quite there yet. Soon, soon. <laughs> soon. Um, but I've gotten a great, great response um, for the most part. Obviously, you know, um, with social media, there's always going to be some negativity uh, response that you will uh, you will get. I, you know, on, I think on one of the videos when I kind of just talked about different types of blindness or, you know, different um stigmas about blindness and things like that a bit of negative but that's you know to be expected but for the most part it's been a pretty good response um really positive even on instagram so a lot i do a lot more post on instagram just sharing um stories or just advocacy things we're sharing you know when there's special days like you know guide dog just just bringing a lot of awareness um and so the response even on there has been quite um great oh that's amazing what are you planning for future installments of thinking in color so a future installment there is a lot i want to do unfortunately i did have to kind of take a step back and a break just um and focus on my health um but and there's been a lot of life changes for me actually as well so definitely um you know sharing some of the life changes that i've been going through um for example moving out on my own um, that's a big one and, and, you know, kind of navigating, um, that there is, um, also, you know, looking into the future, potentially, you know, becoming a mother, um, and yeah, so there, there is a quite a lot more content that, you know, want to put out there and, and share and, and just talk about, um, and yeah, that will be you know, yes, your life. My, my, your <laughs> life. I mean, you know, you're living your your life, and that's what you're talking about yes, on and, YouTube. And also bringing in do other you, people you... that you know have stories and things to share. I know mm-hmm. I had someone on that um spoke about you know navigating and getting the first shot of the COVID vaccine. You know, as living with mm-hmm. a disability, and it was quite interesting to hear their story. 
Oh, no, it is. It's uh, one of the nice things about being uh, on YouTube or having your own channel is just the ability to narrate your personal experience to a wider audience. And you Absolutely. hope that that personal experience will resonate with people in a way that they'll start to realize that your disability isn't your defining factor or the color of your skin isn't your defining factor. It's, you know, it's a part of who you are, but it's not all of who you are. Exactly. What are you hoping that people will think about uh, disability issues and thinking about, you know, uh, it, uh, women with uh, disabilities, in particular Muslim, Muslim women, after they've encountered your YouTube channel? What kind of change are you hoping to see in the world? So I, you know what, I think number one, just just listening and, and interpreting and, and, you know, even if they gain a little bit from that and are able to apply or if I, any if I can encourage them to to make that step that they want to do in their life and for whatever reason if they're scared or afraid or um, you know don't really want to take the risk of of doing it I one thing I guess learning is I the few um, people that I've worked with you know coming from other backgrounds a lot of times you know they they are scared or the parents are you know very sheltering of their kids and and a lot of times it's i'm sitting there instead of kind of getting to know them on the, at, a, at a friend level let's just say you know i'm doing more of the mentoring and saying no no it's okay you know you're you're you know you can live a, a, a you know perfectly independent life you know let your child live that perfect independent life give them the freedom give them the independence to to learn to live on um, by themselves because you're not always going to be around so I think for me for any of them that are watching my videos whether it's a parent or an individual with a disability just you know getting some sort of inspiration and saying well you know what if if she can do it why can't I because I think a lot of us with disabilities we you know listen to podcasts or look at videos you know watch videos and and read social media and we look like oh well that person did it so why can't i i know i have definitely have done that um in in my life and i think the biggest thing for me is mental health right there's so much struggle with mental health and and you know invisible disabilities and and really be able to accept it and come to that come to that point of acceptance i think i've even done a video of me coming to terms with my own disability um and how it's changed my my perspective and my view of how i look at myself differently now as well mm -hmm. right yeah no i like that video i i really enjoyed watching it and it kind of made me think about how I have a very strained relationship and in some ways with my vision loss, like in some ways I accept it and in other ways I don't. So <laughs> that's another conversation. Uh, just before I let you go, I have to ask you, uh, we met through the Trailblazers Tandem Cycling Club in Toronto. It's a great opportunity if you're visually impaired to get on the back of a, si of a bike and go cycling. So Sarah, have you had a chance to go cycling at all this summer or? Did that not? Yeah, I did. Yes, I actually did their group ride of the Niagara on wow. the lake, which was my first group ride of the of the season, um, which was it was wonderful. So, yeah, I've been part of Trailblazers for a few years now, and I've also been um, doing downhill skiing with the Toronto Ski Hawks. So if anyone's interested, <laughs> it's nice to see you now out on the hills as, you know, fall is approaching and winter is around. I applaud your stamina. I chickened out when I saw the Niagara group, right? I said, I don't think I can manage that, but maybe next okay. year. Sarah, thank you so much thank for speaking to me today. It was a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me on, Javita. Sarah Patel is the creator of the Thinking in Color YouTube channel, where she talks about her experiences being low vision and Muslim. You can, of course, check that out on YouTube. That's all the time we have for our show today. Thanks a lot for listening. Our technical producer is Mark Aflalo. Our uh, videographers today are Ted Cooper and Matthew McGurk. And Andy Frank is the manager for AMI-audio. If you have any feedback, you can leave your comments at feedback at ami.ca. You can also find us on Twitter at AMI-audio. Use the hashtag PulseAMI. And finally, if you're interested, you can also subscribe to the podcast, which is available on your favorite podcast platform. And if you're joining us over YouTube, don't forget to subscribe and leave a comment down below so we can always interact with you that way as well. Thanks a lot for listening. I've been your host, Joyita Gupta. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.